Well, welcome back. I hope everyone had a great lunch and has lots of energy for the second half of our program. As we've been talking about building a new Atlanticism, we've always said that security remained a key cornerstone. So this is the perfect moment to have a conversation about a very important upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania in July. We now know that President Zelensky has confirmed his attendance at that summit. We don't know whether Sweden will be welcomed formally as a member at that summit. We hope so. We're looking forward to hearing about regional defense plans and uh, making, uh, maybe wondering, and maybe we'll answer this question, who our next Secretary General of NATO will be. But the most important Secretary General of NATO is right here with your warm applause. Please welcome NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and Helene Cooper. <laughs> New York Times correspondent of the New York Times. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello, Secretary General. <coughs> Hello. Um, thanks for agreeing to do this. I'm supposed to introduce you, but I think this is an audience that you need no introduction. Everybody, this is Jens uh, Stoltenberg, Secretary General of, the, of NATO. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. You know that you have quite the reputation with English-speaking journalists who cover NATO of being very direct <coughs> and concise in press conferences. You don't say more than you intend to say. And then when you get with the Norwegians, you're laughing, <laughs> you're having a ball. So my first question is, what are you telling your countrymen that you're not telling us? Uh, <laughs> I, am, uh, I am telling them Norwegian uh, jokes and anecdotes, and uh, that's, uh, that's easier to be honest, uh, to tell them. No? Um, <laughs> clear, I see clearly. <laughs> I was going to do this in Norwegian, <laughs> but my Norwegian is not really up to par. Uh, so NATO has never been more consequential, I think, than it is, has been in this past year. Uh, when you look back at this past year, what stands out for you? Let me first of all thank, thank you and thank, uh, thank the German Marshal Fund and thank uh, Ian and Heather uh, for, for convening us all here. It's great to be back. The German Marshall Fund is an extremely important platform for transatlantic uh, conversations, dialogue, discussions, uh, which has always been important, but in uh, many, many ways it's even more important now than it has been ever uh, before. Uh, because we have to, uh, to understand that, that, uh, that what we face now, is the war in Ukraine, of course, demonstrates the importance of North America and Europe standing together. But it didn't start on the 24th of February last year. Uh, this war actually started uh, in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea uh, and then a few months later uh, Russia went in and took control over East and Donbass. And since then, since 2014, uh, NATO has implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense in a, gen in a generation. Um, with, uh, for the first time in our history, uh, combat ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance with higher readiness, uh, with more exercises, uh, uh, and, uh, and also with uh, more defense uh, uh, spending. So when uh, uh, President Putin launched it full, his full-fledged invasion last year, we were prepared uh, both to increase our presence in the Eastern part of the alliance, to remove any room for miscalculation uh, or misunderstanding in Moscow about our ability to uh, to, uh, to protect uh, NATO allies, to prevent this conflict from escalating beyond Ukraine, but also to provide support to Ukraine. And since then, we have provided uh, unprecedented support to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. We stepped up the, the support. If I can add that this, what has happened over the last year or the last 15 months, demonstrates that President Putin made at least two big strategic mistakes. One was to underestimate the Ukrainians, uh, the bravery, the, 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 the resolve, uh, the, the, the courage of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian political leadership, and the Ukrainian armed forces. 
and they have been able to push back the Ukrainians from, uh, from the north around he Kiev, the east Kharkiv, and the south around Kherson. Uh, but, but, he, but he also totally underestimated us, NATO allies and, uh, and partners. He didn't expect that all our unity, our resolve to support Ukraine. Um, and, and, uh, and we have provided uh, a lot of support over a long period of time. Just over the last months, we have delivered a lot of heavy armor, battle tanks, uh, the leopards, uh, uh, the, 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 the challengers, and, uh, and, and now also the, the Abrahams tanks from the United States. Um, uh, over the last weeks, the United Kingdom has delivered something which is extremely important, and that is the long-range uh, cruise missiles which are making a difference on the battlefield uh, already. Uh, and then over the last days, we have agreed uh, to start the training of, um, of uh, Ukrainian uh, pilots. This shows a, a kind of a commitment to the long haul. Then I promise to, to end uh, and to take more questions, but, but he has made a big mistake, President Putin, to underest uh, underestimate the Ukrainians, to underestimate us. In turn, we should not underestimate Russia. Because it's right, they, 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 they have taken a lot of casualties. Um, they, they have bad morale, bad equipment, bad training, bad logistics, bad leadership. But what they lack in quality, they try to make up in quantity, mass. Uh, and therefore, we just had to be prepared for long haul. And the only way to do that is to ensure that Europe and North America stand together, not only to deal with the war in Ukraine, but to deal with, with what the war in Ukraine reflects. And that is that we live in a much more competitive world with uh, 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 big power uh, uh, rivalry, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, as uh, including the rise of China, and, uh, and as long as we stand together, North America and Europe, uh, we are able to protect each other. 50% of the world's economic might, 50% of the world's military might. Uh, that is NATO, Europe and North America together. That's what the transatlantic bond is about. I don't know exactly what you asked me about, but this was the question <laughs> I have prepared. I knew this was going to come. So, yeah. But I see, it's, it's weird because I have all these questions I want to ask you, but you just said something that tripped, tripped me up because you said it's important. We certainly did underestimate Ukrainian will, uh, but you're saying it's important that we don't underestimate Russia. Haven't we overestimated Russia in the past? We thought they were going to bring a whole lot more to bear here than they've managed to, especially militarily. But I think the jury is out. I mean, th this war is not over. Uh, uh, yeah. what, what, what we have seen is that the Ukrainians are, have been uh, extremely capable of using the resources yeah. they have. And of course, they impressed the whole world. Uh, starting with, with President Zelensky saying, I don't need, need a ride, I need ammunition on the first day. Uh, and, and of course, that sent an enormous uh, strong political message. And I think that the, the war and the, uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian leadership had demonstrated the importance of political leadership in a war. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and therefore, they have been able to achieve uh, uh, impressive things by liberating big sorts of Ukrainian land in the north, in the east, and, and in the south. But you know, now the fronts have been quite static for a long time. So the Russians have been able to dig in uh, deep defensive lines with uh, uh, trenches for battle tanks, for, uh, for to, to stop battle tanks, uh, uh, that what we call the dragon teeth, which is these concrete uh, things which are spread around tens of many, many, many kilometers of of, of uh, stopping uh, armored vehicles from, from passing. And then, of course, a lot of different, quite advanced minefields in different layers. So now the next stage is to penetrate, to push through these defensive lines, which have been building uh, for months. Uh, and, and to do so, they need modern, advanced equipment. They need the battle tanks. Uh, they need uh, uh, the, uh, the infantry fighting vehicles. Um, which they uh, have. They have them. Yeah, they have them. But 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 they also. I think we. I think many of us underestimate uh, the importance of what the military guys calls or experts calls enablement and 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 sustainment, because they need engineering capabilities to cross the minefields, uh, to mine plows, to 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 to, to breach the, uh, these yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 these obstacles, and that's highly specialized things, and they need those to to allow the the battle tanks to operate. Then, of course, all these battle tanks or infantry fighting vehicles, 
they need sustainment, meaning that they can operate for a day or two, or, but then they need spare parts, they need fuel, they need special uh, lubricants, uh, they need uh, maintenance uh, repair capacity. Uh, and, and, and as you all know, a, a battle tank doesn't drive to the tanking station for fuel. The tanking station has to drive to the battle tank in the battlefield. So, so this whole logistics thing, it's enormous. Uh, uh, this is a war of attrition, and the war of attrition becomes a battle of logistics. And sometimes you have extremely focused on whether it will be this or that type of battle tank or, or uh, F-16s or so on. That's important. But I think we sometimes underestimate the importance of ensuring that all the systems which are already in Ukraine function and work and deliver effect as they're supposed to do. And then there is a flow of supplies, fuel, ammunition, spare parts that is needed. And, and this huge logistical undertaking is actually now organized by, also by also it's, it's a cur, uh, uh, is, 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 is responsible, but, but in his capacity as the, yeah. uh, the, the, the supreme US commander of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. And it's of quite impressive. Uh, and it has to yeah. continue. Yes. Uh, they just put this ugly clock up, and we are actually already halfway done. I don't understand. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand how no. that is even remotely possible. No. No. But what you just said uh, is the perfect seg segue to my next question, which is that you said in the past that Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO. Uh, how do you see that actually happening? And I don't mean militarily, because as you just laid out, the Ukrainians have, the Ukrainian military has more than proved itself very capable. Uh, Ukrainian troops have been trained on NATO standard equipment. We just uh, sent nine mechanized brigades, Ukrainian brigades, back to Ukraine for this counteroffensive. Uh, and they've shown that they've learned how to do the type of combined arms maneuvers that the United States military practices. But politically, seems is the far bigger issue. How can you li lay out the practical pathway for Ukraine to actually get into to NATO? I think I have to start by admitting that on that issue, there are different views in the alliance. Uh, and of course, the only way to make decisions in NATO is uh, by consensus. Um, uh, there are consultations going on now. Uh, um, I will have some phone calls later on today also uh, on, on, uh, uh, on the way forward, the path forward, uh, 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 and how to address the, the Ukrainians' uh, ambitions for, um, uh, for NATO uh, membership. Uh, so, so I, 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 I'm no, no one is able to tell you exactly what will be the final decision at the Vilnius summit on this issue. But, but we are an alliance of now 31 allies, and of course the only way to make decisions is to have discussions, to consult, and then uh, at the end of the day we always end at a, uh, at a, at a joint position or a, 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 a some, 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 some kind of consensus. Uh, but, but, but having said that, I would like to also highlight the following. We also agree on a lot when it comes to Ukraine and membership. We all agree that Ukraine will become a member of the alliance. That was actually stated very clearly at the Madrid summit last year uh, and, and uh, has been repeated many times since we made the first decision back in 2008. We all agree that NATO's door is open uh, for new members and that it is for uh, the NATO allies and uh, Ukraine to decide uh, when they should join, not Moscow. They don't have a veto. Um, uh, and then we also agree that the most urgent and important task now is to ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent nation. Because if Ukraine doesn't prevail, yeah. then there's no membership issue to discuss. Do you think this war makes it easier for Ukraine to get into NATO than before February 24th? Well, y yes and no. I, th I think that everyone realized that uh, to, 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 to become a member in the midst of war is, 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 is not uh, uh, on the agenda, and, and, and that's not the issue. The issue is more what happens when the war yeah, ends, yeah. Um, in one way or another. Uh, uh, and, then, um, uh, and, and then, of course, the war 
uh, ensures that Ukraine is becoming even closer to NATO. You mentioned all this, the things we are doing together with them. When, if we, if we, when we start pilot training, of course, then, then they will be more interoperable, closer to NATO. When they use now more and more NATO uh, uh, equipment and so on, they are coming closer to NATO when it comes to, uh, to, to how to operate different uh, uh, NATO systems. So one of the things I actually believe and I hope and I think that we will agree in Vilnius is a multi-year program uh, by NATO and NATO allies to help Ukraine to transition from Soviet era mm -hmm. doctrines, equipment, standards to NATO doctrines, equipment and standards. And this sounds a bit technical, but it's extremely important. Uh, uh, because but that's already happening anyway. Well, I it is happening, but it's a huge task. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and by agreeing this program, uh, we, uh, we, are, uh, we will then be more ambitious and more concrete on what we are going to do. Uh, to actually, to, 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 not, to not only gradually move them towards NATO standards, because if you look at what they have, it's a lot of old Soviet yeah. era stuff, uh, uh, both equipment, but also doctrines and, uh, and, uh, and, and way of organizing their armed forces. Now they actually live in uh, two worlds. They have a lot of old stuff, and then they have a lot of Soviet stuff, and then they have a lot of NATO stuff, and then a lot of different NATO stuff. So, so, so to, 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 to make this more coherent uh, is extremely important, and the aim is to make them fully interoperable with NATO forces, regardless of when uh, membership will happen, this is good. It will make them more able to protect themselves or to defend, uh, and of course us more able to work with them, uh, the more they are uh, also the same standards, doctrines and, uh, and, uh, and procedures. Um, this is the point where I'm supposed to open it up for questions, but I have a couple more. Uh, before I, I do that, since we only have 10 minutes uh, left, uh, I want to ask you about Donald Trump. Um, you are the consummate diplomat, and I watched you during the Trump presidency, and you did a really good job. Every time he started jumping up and down about NATO, European countries not playing their fair share, you used that to try to get European countries to meet the 2%. And you credit, and then you credited him uh, with getting them, getting some countries a little bit more and getting a sense of urgency on that, which was really interesting to watch as he was also screaming about how he wanted to withdraw from, from NATO. What, I guess, would be your advice to your successor uh, if we end up with a second Trump presidency? My advice to any Secretary General of NATO is to, to make sure that we stay together. The, the main task, the most important thing, uh, the head of the North Atlantic Council, which is the Secretary General of NATO, is to keep this family together. And of course, that's not al always easy, uh, it, and it has never been, uh, because we are uh, now 31, soon 32 with Sweden, uh, different nations from both sides of the Atlantic with different history, different geography, different political uh, leaders. Uh, but, 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 but we have been able always to unite around the core task of protecting and defending us, each other uh, despite uh, uh, differences. I think I, as, as, uh, some of us, or at least I have watched this, uh, this series, The Crown. And then one of the episodes there is about the Suez Crisis with two NATO allies, uh, France and the uh, and, uh, and United Kingdom, went into Egypt without telling the United States. Well, that was in 56. Uh, and of course, I think the atmosphere at the NATO meetings was not the best at that time. You're the only person who watched that episode and thought about NATO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I learned a lot. I used that again. Like I was actually inspired <laughs> to think that if they managed that in 56, I can manage... Uh, uh, yeah, whatever happens now. Uh, 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 then then, then, then in, uh, NATO's headquarters were not in Brussels. It was in Paris. I was in a beautiful picture with a nice view from my office, as a Secretary General office, uh, of, of, of the Eiffel Tower. And then, I don't know exactly what happens, but, 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 uh, <laughs> but it was something about the relationship between uh, President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson and, uh, and de Gaulle that ended up that uh, NATO had to leave. Uh, and again, I don't, I, I'm not saying who was right or who was wrong, but at least we had to leave and we ended up in an old hospital outside Brussels uh, <laughs> as a temporary uh, 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 solution for 50 years. Um, uh, but uh, again, then, then, then actually France left the military structures yeah. of, uh, of NATO, but NATO survived. And then the Iraq war, I mean, we had half of the allies were against and half of the allies were in favor. 
So I'm, I'm saying this just to, to, to because it has happened before, it will certainly happen again, that there are disagreements in NATO. And my message to President Trump, as it has been to all other allies who disagree or, or have different views, is that, okay, these are serious stuff, be it the uh, climate change or, or the Iran nuclear deal or, or, or Suez crisis, whatever the, it has been or, or will be, but, but just make sure to, that you understand that even for the United States, it's very good to have friends and allies. Because you know, a strong NATO is good for Europe, but a strong NATO is also very good for the United States. Because no other major power has so many friends and allies. Russia, China doesn't have anything like that. Uh, and they invited me, actually during the Trump years, to speak to the joint session of the Congress. And my main message was that it's I good. I covered that. Yeah, it's good to have friends. It's uh, quite obvious for me. Uh, but sometimes it's good to remind that we are friends. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that worked quite well. Was that funny? Because, <laughs> <laughs> because, because the, thing, the, th the thing is that as the United States is concerned about the size of China. Because the United States used to always be, be, be biggest, but when it comes to China, they're not always biggest and leading all uh, areas. But if they add 30, then it's 30 other allies, uh, 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 big and small, uh, from, from Iceland and Norway to, uh, to Germany and the United Kingdom, that, that's a lot. And that makes them, that uh, make us, as a NATO in total, represent 50% of world GDP and 50% of the world military might. So compared to anyone else, we are big when we have uh, all the friends and allies in NATO. That's also good for the United States. My last question, you bring up China. Can China be a credible mediator on Ukraine? Uh, so f um, it, so it's, it's for Ukraine to decide. It, uh, because I'm uh, just afraid that we now start, in a way, in Brussels, uh, at NATO or uh, in the German Marshall Fund, uh, to start to tell the Ukrainians what they should do. I think they have proven extremely capable of making their own decisions as a sovereign independent nation. They are paying the price, the highest price. We, are, we, we, we complain about high energy prices. I understand that because energy prices have been high. We complain about the high inflation and, and the cost of delivering support to, to Ukraine. So we pay a price. Uh, and, and that's serious, and it matters for normal people, working people in our countries. But, but the price we pay is measured in, in money. The price they pay is measured in lost lives. Yeah. So I think, I, think it, w I say this all because I really believe that it is for the Ukrainians to make the judgments of what are the conditions, what are the frameworks for potential uh, talks and negotiations. I welcome the, 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 the talk, the phone call between President Xi and President Zelensky. Uh, there was also a Chinese envoy in, 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 in Kiev. I totally trust them that they will find out that. What we have told China is, of course, that they should condemn the illegal invasion of Ukraine. They which, haven't uh, done No, that. they haven't. And, of course, they should in no way provide uh, uh, a little support to, to uh, weapons to uh, Russia. And, uh, uh, of course, we are concerned when we see m more general that Russia and China are uh, working more and more closely yeah. together. Uh, but on the role of China, well, uh, uh, we welcome efforts to find a, uh, a solution uh, and it's for Ukraine to decide what are the correct frameworks. Question, uh, whoa. <laughs> uh, we have microphones in the audience. I'm gonna start with the lady right there in the cool blue suit. And um, let's do, uh, actually, let's do all three, all four of you. Um, make, you know, one question, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, a question, not a statement. And yes. Thank you so speed much. round. And maybe we we'll do all four. Can you, can you handle all four, and then you answer after the four? I think you I can. I don't know. I it's think my you can. My intellectual capacity I don't know. is limited, you know, it's but it's uh, I will yeah. try. I will <laughs> write them down, and let's see. Okay. Yeah. In defense of the questions, yeah. uh, Mr. Secretary General, thank you for, for being with us today. And Please identify yourself. Yes, uh, being the supporter of Ukraine. I'm Darina Onishko, European Democracy Youth Network, Ukrainian of origin. Something that we have not discussed today is security guarantees or any possibility of that. Uh, we have different security frameworks being proposed, like Kyiv Security Compact, or right now UK, France, considering providing such guarantees in terms of end of the war. Uh, what is your um, attitudes or opinion on this? What is realistic uh, from your perspective? And would this be a step towards the NATO membership? Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, dear Secretary General. I'm Miranda Kabladze from Georgia, and 20% uh, of my country is occupied by Russian. Here I am as a JMF alumni, and I have a quick question for you. Uh, after this Ukrainian war, it was very evident that the countries like Central and Eastern European Europe, they have started thinking of reshaping it and uh, establishing an internal and regional organizations that will have a better coordinated defense cooperation among them. and. Uh, uh, with an increased Russian propaganda in the region and especially in Georgia and Russia abolished visa regime in Georgia and increased flow of Russians within the country. Can you reassure once again Georgia's uh, membership into NATO and your support towards this process? Because we don't really see, Georgian people does not really see itself as part of the small alliances with any countries with so-called neighborhoods in our, our northern neighbors. Thank you. We have 50 seconds left, so make it fast. Uh, Salome Mgeladze, the vice president of the European Democracy Youth Network. I'm from Georgia as well, and yes, 20% of our country is occupied uh, with Rus by Russia. With the ongoing war in Ukraine and Russian street, how could you help to, uh, to Georgian people to avoid the possible Russian aggression and to move uh, and to move forward to NATO membership? Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Right there. I make it very short. I'm Matthias from the uh, America Europe Youth Forum. I have a very practical question. We have armed Ukraine to a great extent, and we see in uh, former battlefields around the world, we have a big problem with unexploded uh, explosive ordnance and um, weapons that pop up in a civilian uh, context. So is there a plan of NATO or of the alliance to disarm Ukraine when this conflict ends? Okay, uh, thank you. As a first on uh, on the issue of uh, security assurances, arrangements, guarantees, the question you asked. Well, th that's partly linked to what we discussed about membership, of course. Uh, the ultimate security guarantee will be uh, a NATO membership, but uh, as I just described, that's not something that uh, will happen in the midst of a war. The question is, uh, uh, what will we decide on uh, and how will we address uh, the uh, the issue of membership at the at the Vilnius uh, summit, uh, and as I said, it's too early to uh, to uh, to say. Uh, uh, but what we will do most likely is that we'll agree at least this program of making uh, Ukraine even coming more closer to NATO and more interoperable with uh, with uh, uh, with NATO. Uh, then, um, then, then I think it's as wars are by nature unpredictable. And no one can tell exactly how this war ends, uh, or when it ends. Uh, they, uh, but what we do know is that when it ends, it is extremely important to uh, make sure that it doesn't start again, that, that the pattern of Russian aggressive behavior continues, and that President Putin cannot continue to chip away at European security with just a, a, a pause and then uh, start again. So we need to make sure that we have arrangements in place to deter further Russian aggression. Uh, that is partly to or to provide military support to Ukraine to uh, help them deter and defend themselves. But that will also then open the discussions about different kinds of security arrangements. And that, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the Kiev compact and, and different kinds of secure bilateral things have been on the table, but it's, it's, it's far too early to conclude exactly. And we will have the discussion uh, uh, on the membership as you move towards the, uh, the NATO uh, uh, summit. Um, then, uh, then uh, on uh, on Georgia, we're actually two different questions, but two two questions questions on Georgia. First, on Georgia, I think that so so Georgia is part of the pattern uh, because it, it didn't start as, as I said. It started in 2014. Well, the war in Ukraine started in in 2014, but but Russia's aggressive actions against neighbors didn't start in 14. At least it started in 2018, uh, so sorry, 2008, uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, invasion into Georgia. Um, so 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 it is this pattern uh, that 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 uh, is a st stark reminder of that this is not only about this war in Ukraine; it's about that the relationship we tried after the end of the Cold War to build with Russia a better, friendlier relationship uh, has failed because of Russia's. Uh, aggressive behavior. They want to uh, 
re-establish spheres of influence to control neighbors. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's not a world uh, we uh, would like to live in, because that means that a lot of neighbors, former Soviet republics and members of the Warsaw Pact, uh, will not have the independence uh, uh, we strongly believe that uh, all countries should, uh, should have. And therefore, NATO has uh, worked with uh, Georgia for many, many years. We are helped to implement reforms, practical political cooperation. Uh, and of course, after war, we've also seen that countries which are neither, also which, which are, we call them sometimes in between, which I think is not the best phrase, but, but which are you know, not NATO allies, but then uh, 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 try to also uh, uh, resist uh, coercion from, uh, from, uh, from, from Russia. Uh, they are vulnerable. Uh, so we are. We decided uh, at the Madrid summit to, to step up what we do for uh, these countries, and of course Georgia is is, is uh, one of the strongest examples. Having said that, I think also we have to understand that it is important that Georgia lives up to to the democratic values we all believe in, um, and uh, of course we also expect uh, non-NATO allies uh, to adhere to the sanctions and to and to and to not make it easier for Russia uh, to uh, finance and to organize uh, the war of aggression against, uh, uh, against uh, 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 Ukraine. Uh, then um, on uh, unexploded ordinances, well, that's always an issue after a war. They need to uh, uh, clean up to get rid of those. Uh, we have uh, started some discussions about what we'll do after war. It's also part of what we're discussing at NATO. But again, of course, the main issue now is to end the war by ensuring that uh, Ukraine prevails. Uh, but then after that, there is a huge task of reconstruction, including by removing mines and unexploded uh, ordinances, which, which will be a, yeah, a big, big task uh, uh, for many countries to uh, take part in. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, what should I say, making as many jokes in English as in uh, as Norwegian. As always. <laughs> uh, but the, the only way to, to solve that is for you to learn Norwegian. So next time... I'm working on uh, it. Uh, uh, I, know, I'm I know, I know. I'm working on it. Uh, thank you very uh, much, sir. Good luck in Vilnius. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. We're out of time.